Welcome everyone to this special webinar event. This is a promotional talk and sponsored webinar by NOAA Medical and Illuminal Robotics and Lung Navigation. Where do we go from here? Before we get started, everyone, please note your control panel. You all have joined in a listen only mode. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the question feature on your control panel. We will get to all of your questions at the end of the presentation. At this time, I'll hand it over to Dr. Joe Sesenia to get us started. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Emily. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I think it's a, uh, it's going to be a nice presentation over the next uh, hour. Uh, it'll be uh, myself. I'll be talking about how robots have changed the game in navigation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Badra uh, will then uh, talk about uh, what are the gaps that uh, still remain, and then Dr. Uh, Hogarth will talk a little bit about future systems and, and how how they will solve these gaps. So, um, uh, no further ado, well, we'll move on. Uh, set my screen up here good so my talk is on bronchoscopy robots and how they've changed the game in lung navigation uh, uh hopefully many of you uh, know me and if you don't um my name is joe Cecenia. i uh, work at the cleveland clinic in the section of bronchoscopy and i've been uh, i don't know i've been chasing nodules for uh probably almost uh, 20 years now since the original super dimension uh, came out so um i don't know if i'm don quixote uh chasing them or if i'm uh you know, Wiley Coyote, or if I'm actually that leprechaun on the other side of the, the rainbow. But we'll see by the time we get to the end of this presentation where we stand. So just some uh, relevant disclosures and um, uh, specifically uh, NOAA Medical. I've done some consulting work for them. Um, but uh, in my presentation, uh, really, there's uh, nothing uh, here related to NOAA uh, uh, at all. So uh, let's sort of get to the roots of this, uh, things that people uh, have probably seen you know, dozens of times already over the many years. And this is the famous uh, uh, study by uh, Jessica Wong um, and Gerard uh, uh, Silvestri, looking at back almost uh, uh, over, 10, uh, over a decade now, looking at the various different modalities of, of bronchoscopy. It was a, a sort of a, a conglomeration of virtual bronch, ENB, radial ultrasound, so on and so forth. And if you look at their uh, uh, if we look at their yields in the in the second column, all about the same. So lots of different technologies tagging the nodule a lot of different ways, and remarkably, or maybe not so remarkably, um, uh, all uh, pretty much have the same uh, had the same yield. Um, there were some criticisms of that. Um, uh, people uh, who do certain technologies or a certain technique get really super good at it, um, and um, uh, but what was really happening during this this time in the United States was was electromagnetic na electromagnetic navigation was really taking off, and that that kind of impetus led to the Navigate study, which 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 now is is gosh, it was almost uh, almost uh, uh, five to ten years old now. This data, and it was a huge multi-center trial. Um, everyone and their mo mother was probably in it. It was a it was a group of uh, academics. Uh, it was a group of community docs all getting together and uh, uh, and doing uh, 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 electromagnetic uh, navigation bronchoscopy with the super dimension system and pooling their data. And uh, there's uh, several versions of the Navigate study in the literature. Uh, this is the one-year uh, follow-up uh, data. Uh, and uh, for the most part, I'll go through this super quick, but this was real-world stuff, and that's what the company wanted. They wanted real-world stuff. They had an average, average lesion size of about two centimeters. Um, uh, a bronchocyne was present on less than half. And um, they basically told everybody, use your uh, Super D and use it the way you use it, whether you use it with general anesthesia or, or conscious sedation, whether you use radial bus or, or not. Just, just do it and, and report out your results. And uh, these are the results that they got. They had a 12-month diagnostic yield of 72.9%, so roughly around 73%. Uh, and they included the unsuccessful navigation cases, which, which was roughly 6% 6, 6 of their total pool. Um, their deferred case analysis, meaning that they followed all these non-diagnostics up for, the, for another year. Um, if they were all false negatives, they'd have a yield of 66.4. If they're all true negatives, they'd have a yield of 75.4. Um, on their two-year data, which they published just a few months ago, um, that number, I think, settled around 69%, at least for the United States. Um, and their sensitivity for malignancy was 68.8. So if you take that number, 72%, 73%, 70%, it, it really uh, kind of reflected back on, on Jessica's study from several years, almost a decade ago, 
a yield of around 70%. Um, if you look at the subgroup analysis, which is which is what we all kind of like to do now these days, looking at nodules and different aspects of the nodules, I find it interesting, and I, I quoted the, the, the Navigate investigators in their discussion, um, because I think it's really relevant to what we're going to talk about today and what we deal with uh, 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 in our day-to-day -day lives. They recognized what they thought was a challenging nodule. So with consecutive enrollment, Navigate includes a significant proportion of traditionally difficult lesions, right? Um, those that are less than 20 millimeters, those are in the upper lobes, uh, those without a reported bronchocyne, and 67% and out in the periphery of the lung, 25% off the pleura. And if you look at this, if you look at their, if you look at their results, if you see, if you look at the, uh, the left side of the slide, you'll see that, that, that discriminator, that line at 20 millimeters, you can see a big jump in, in yield when you get over 20 millimeters. Um, depending on where you are, you see kind of a, a, a bigger jump in the upper lobes compared to the lower lobes, less yield in the lower lobes. And I think Dr. Bodger will talk a little bit about this later. Um, if you look at the, it, whether it be in the middle or peripheral part of the lung, maybe not much of a difference, but a, 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 again, another spread when there's a bronchocyte present. So an airway to the lesion, much better yield than an airway not to the lesion. And again, distance to the pleura, maybe, maybe not so much. So the things that really pop out here that the, that the authors recognized long ago was that nodule size and bronchocyte really sort of impact yield. So, so explain this. Why does it impact the yield? Why were we stuck at 70% with this, with this first generation navigation or, or, or any other um, uh, guided bronchoscopy before that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. We all know what that is. If, 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 I don't know how many of you out there are doing navigational bronchoscopy or any kind of nodule bronchoscopy, but if you are, you feel this pain, right? So the plastic catheter, the plastic catheter is great. They make several different mo uh, varieties of the plastic catheter at different angles, whether you're at 45, 90, 180, stiff tip, soft tip, whatever. But the problem with plastic catheters is they deflect when you put a, a stiff tool into them. And you can see that on the right side of the screen, right? There's an edge 90 on the right, and you can see what happens when you put a more stiff catheter in. And you can see this, this is reflected on, on, the, uh, on the actual floral, live floral views on the bottom, D, E, and F. You can see what the catheter looks like. And then you put something out and the catheter deflects because the, the, the uh, uh, tool is straight. A bronchocyte obviously is also important. We also know this from our, our regular practice. You have a nodule going straight into the lesion. Um, the tool, uh, the biopsy tool will generally go straight into the lesion. If you're on the side of the lesion, like in panel B, you don't really have a tool that can make a 90 degree turn into that lesion. So, uh, you know, uh, obviously you're gonna have a little bit less yield uh, um, with this. A plastic catheter just can't make that, that turn. If, and if, if you can imagine, being eccentric with just a uh, an ultra a very soft ultrasound probe in it. Imagine what happens uh, uh, when you put a stiffer biopsy tool into this. It just it just makes it very very difficult to uh, to, to get this biopsy. And I think Dr. Bajra will talk a little bit later about atelectasis. But when you actually think of the things that we can improve upon, just from a just from the the the, the procedure itself, just from the hardware of the of, of the procedure itself, right? You're going to think um, you're going to think a little bit about positioning. You're going to think about um, uh, tool, and you're going to think about catheter. Um, this is a really great study that was done by Dr. Pritchett and Bajra, um, and uh, this shows a little bit of what we're going to be talking about later, which is about um, uh, CT to body divergence. What they they did a really slick study. They they basically uh, did a cone beam uh, CT uh, at the time of the procedure. They identified where the virtual target was at the time of the CT, and then they defined in that 3D space where the actual target lesion was using cone beam CT. And not surprisingly, they found that they didn't match. In fact, there was very little overlap between where the CT told you the nodule was versus really where the nodule was during the procedure. Um, before location correction, you could see on the bottom, on the left-hand side, before location correction, you, uh, you could see that almost a third of patients had less than 25% overlap. So very little overlap, if at all, in these nodules. Um, after location correction, and this was done with, uh, 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 I believe, not, not the Illumicyte, but the version just before Illumicyte, the Medtronic uh, 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 version. After location correction, you improve that overlap but still almost 
fifty percent of um, of nodules had a less than fifty percent overlap. So remember, your target may not always be your target when you're dealing with first generation navigation. That that where you see the green ball isn't always where the nodule is. So how do we overcome these challenges of first gen navigation? Well, there's CT to body divergence strategies, so improvement of ventilation strategies, which have been, been well documented to prevent atelectasis and better CT procedural lung volume match, um, you know, where that nodule is in the CT versus where the nodule is in real life, uh, decreasing the time of the procedure to prevent atelectasis, but also interprocedural real-time imaging, such as the using cone beam CT or using some sort of fluoroscopic navigation that could give you that that registration or that that localization correction, uh, things that you get with a lumicite or, or, or using lung vision. What do we do with the eccentric nodules? Well, maybe we can replace the plastic catheter with something that has a structural integrity where you could actually keep that 90 degree bend. Um, and uh, that's what that that's where robotic bronchoscopy kind of makes that next leap, right? It it, it gives us a, a catheter, basically a catheter tip. That catheter tip is the tip of your bronchoscope right, that has a lot of structural integrity. It's not going to give in to the stiffness of the, of, of the biopsy tool. Um, so, so you replace that plastic catheter with a robotic scope. You could keep that, that aiming mechanism a lot more uh, uh, um, um, on, on, on target of where you want it to be and where you want to go. Um, this is a, a, a nice little version of, here's the EWC on the left. You can see what happens to the EWC when you put a needle in. I showed you this before. And uh, if you go over, you can see that robot stays exactly, the, the, the structural integrity of the tip is near perfect. The other good thing about the, ro the robot is it gets out into the periphery. Um, this is as far out as you could get with an Olymposcope. Uh, the Olympus 3.6, the 4.9 obviously doesn't get you very far. The 3.6 gets you a little bit further, but the robotic scopes can actually get you out um, uh, much further. Again, you're basically taking the tip of what was your plastic catheter and extending it out all the way to the periphery of the lung with structural integrity and directionality. So that's where the robot has a much greater uh, um, uh, effect and uh, promise than it does using uh, uh, technologies with plastic catheters. So to review, what's the value prop of, 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 of the robotic scopes? You get better tip integrity, greater reach to the periphery, direct visualization of the lesion, hopefully gets us better overall yield. So what, what, is, what does the data show us? Luckily, we have some papers that have been published and uh, we could talk about this value prop and how it has uh, been reported out to the literature. This is somewhat of an overview of, um, of the studies that are out there. The studies differ a little bit in, in their definitions of yield, and we're not going to spend too much time on that. Um, some, some do a better job at defining uh, a, a yield than others. Uh, some are conservative, some are very, very liberal. I'm going to show you the ones that were very conservative. Um, but uh, for the most part, there's somewhere around five studies that looked at this, and we're going to uh, discuss three right now. Um, this is the, one of the very first studies that was published. Uh, this was a multi-center uh, trial of the, of the very first uh, users, real-world users of, of the Monarch robot. Um, Uta Chada was the lead author uh, when, uh, uh, when he was at the uh, University of Chicago, um, and this included um, uh, um, uh, uh, Erie, this included Philly, this included Michigan, a whole bunch of places that kind of got together and pulled their data. Um, and uh, uh, not to get into too much granularity, it was 165 procedures, 167 nodules. The average size of their nodule is 25 millimeters, which is sort of where you'd expect it to be with, when you adopt a new technology. Um, most, of the, uh, uh, most of the patients, uh, most of the nodules were in the upper lobe, but a good proportion of them were in the lower lobe, which tends to be a little bit more challenging than the upper lobe. Um, peripheral lesion in over 70%, and most of them were solid. A bronchocyne in, 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 in only 60%. So, so challenging nodules, and you can see their overall yield was 69 to 77 percent, depending on sort of how you find uh, uh, inflammation. Um, but look, it's it's around that 70 percent, 75 percent marker that we saw before. But important things popped out, right? No difference in yield with regard to nodule location. So the so the areas like the lower lobes where you traditionally expect to have more difficulty didn't seem to really matter. A bronchus sign. Um, 73% yield with a bronchus sign. 
Um, I'm not sure if they had a direct view, but but with the Bronco sign, they had an exceptionally good yield. Uh, if you look at the Rebus view, um, it didn't really matter if um, they had an eccentric or concentric view. Their, their yields were quite high, but if they had no view at all, you could see their yield uh, drop. But again, I want to point out here that in a quarter of their patients, when they had no Ebus image at all, they still got a yield in, in, in over a quarter of those patients, which I think speaks to the structural integrity of that tip. Um, and uh, <clears throat> as you could see that as the nodule got bigger, as you would expect, uh, uh, the yield improved. And that was really the first salvo into this. And I give those guys a lot of credit because they put a lot of lipstick on a pig. They had first generation software they were like the first adopters of this technology. Uh, they had no guidance from previous users, and I think they had really excellent results. Uh, this is the benefit trial. This is a sponsored trial by the uh, um, uh, by Oris. Um, this was across uh, several centers, uh, 54 procedures, 54 nodules. Uh, each center contributed around 15 procedures per site. Again, majority of cases was was with, was with Monarch's first generation software. And the primary outcome uh, was lesion localization with Rebus. Okay, so what we we're really looking for here was could we localize? Um, and the diagnostic yield was was very conservative. Um, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. And if you look at the nodule properties here, very similar to the uh, to the Chata study, uh, the nodule size, the average nodule size was 23 millimeters, so slightly larger maybe than real world. A bronchocyte only in 59% um, um, uh, uh, of patients. And you can see about two thirds in the upper lobe, a third in the lower lobe. If you look at lesion localization um, overall, um, uh, there was a 96% localization defined by radial ultrasound imaging. However, only 60% of those were concentric. So a good proportion um, of, of, lot of, of nodules were seen with radial ultrasound, but a large uh, uh, percentage of those were eccentric nodules, the ones where we really struggle with. Um, however, the overall diagnostic yield was 74%. And you can see very similar to, uh, to uh, the university, uh, sorry, to Chata's trial, uh, the concentric and eccentric yields were pretty good and not statistically different. Um, again, uh, over, over three centimeters, obviously we had a much better yield. Uh, it didn't get broken down into, into smaller uh, quartiles or tertiles. So this is the best I could give you here. Um, this is a study from the University of Chicago. Um, this is a, a, their first 124 patients on the robot. They used a very conservative definition of yield with a 12-month follow-up. Again, they had navigation to lesion in 94% um, based on system imaging. 82% of those uh, were seen by radial EBUS with an overall accuracy of 77%. And the accuracy was contingent upon the radial EBUS, EBUS view. So if you had, they had an accuracy of 85% with a concentric view, if they had an eccentric view where we normally struggle, still an 84% uh, accuracy, but they have no radial EBUS view as you would expect. It dropped significantly. Remember that if you have, if you don't have, if they didn't get that kind of, if they relied upon the, um, in other words, if they were, uh, uh, relied upon what the system told them versus what the radial EBUS told them, okay, their yield somewhat dropped. So no, no radial EBUS view, they, they struggled with yield. Let's move into the ion study. And this is the largest uh, uh, ion study that used really the best uh, uh, and conserve, most conservative definition of yield. And this came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. This is a Chavez and, uh, and Deckel study with a whole bunch of other people uh, uh, in between. Very, very well done study, in my opinion. 159 lesions in 130 patients. Um, the median lesion size was a little bit lower, it was 18 millimeters, so more real world, I think, for us. A bronchocyte in about 60%. They had um, uh, an 85% localization rate. I, actually, that, that, that's, I misstate, uh, let me actually move to uh, here. Uh, 131 procedures, 159 nodules, and here is uh, their lesion size, 18 millimeters, a third of them in the lower lobes, a bronchocyte in, um, in, uh, in 60 percent, so pretty much what we see in the real world. Um, they used radial EBUS in 85 percent of patients. They had an overall localization of 98 percent, but it's unclear if image guidance was used here, and how they defined their localization was, was a little um, undefined, but uh, for the most part, they either used 2D fluoroscopy or 2D, 3D fluoroscopy to get that, so we'll take them at their word a 98% localization using the ion. 
Their overall yield was pretty good, an 81.7% yield. However, I think this was somewhat driven by the amount of, of nodules they had over three centimeters. When you really look at it, it was a pretty significant drop off when she dropped under 20 millimeters. They dropped off uh, to basically a 68% yield. So uh, um, they're, you know, 100% yield in lesions uh, in, in lung masses over three centimeters. So I think if you pool all this together and look at localization versus diagnostic yield, you'll see the robot could really very nicely localize for you um, because of how it articulates at the end, how you can get it all the way out to the lesion. It keeps its shape when you need it to keep its shape. However, there's still a drop in diagnostic yield. There's still a gap. There's still a delta. The 94%, 96%, 98% localization didn't equilibrate uh, 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 or equivocate to a 90% plus yield. Why, why might that be? What have we learned? And we're going to talk about this a little bit later. So I'm going to kind of leave it off here. But when you think about the value props of the, of the robots, there are clearly proposed advantages that work out. There's better tip integrity. There's greater reach to the periphery. There's some, there, in some cases, there's direct visualization of the lesion and, and perhaps better overall yield. What we're seeing in the literature is that yield has only increased modestly. Remember, Navigate was around 70%. Everything before Navigate was 70, around 70%. And what we're getting with uh, yields and published uh, uh, data here is around 74, 75%. So not a crazy in, uptick in, in, in yields. Localization clearly seems improved, um, but how we define uh, 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 localization, I think we're going to have to better define as we move in the future. There's some mention of visualization, which is one of the value props of, uh, of, of the Oris robot, um, but still not, uh, it's still not 100%, even uh, the yield still wasn't 100% even when it occurred. And the yield, however, doesn't seem to be connected to rebus confirmation, and it may be more tied to image guidance. Cone beam CT, 3D fluoro, there's a lot of other ex uh, uh, accessory imaging techniques that were used with uh, some of these trials that may uh, have affected their yield. But still, I think we have a, a little bit of a ways to go. And I think I'm going to leave this to uh, Dr. Bajra and hey. to Dr. Hogarth to explain the rest. Okay. Hey, Joe, real quick before Chris starts. The yeah. last study you demonstrated where the yield obviously was influenced by the ability to biopsy a mass. So things over the three centimeters clearly skewed that data. I'm mm -hmm. thinking back to the slide, I was thinking back to that slide that you had with from Krish and Mike that demonstrated the, the huge degree of separation between reality and then the day of the case. But it's something that large, CT to body divergence is only so much, right, Krish? I mean, those were, you were going after, in that study, these were sub two centimeter lesions. So when something's almost four centimeters, even with a two centimeter divergence, there's still a lot of overlap. Yeah. Yeah, and you would think that the larger the nodule, the the, the, the more that overlap, even if it's 20% overlap, uh, that's that could be, you know, three centimeters of overlap. So yeah, you're, you've, you're, got, you've got horseshoes and hand grenades. It's okay yeah, to miss. It's, less, it's less more difficult to miss, yeah. Yeah. Joe, that was great. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about the gaps that still remain in the current robotic platforms. Um, and this should be interesting. And a lot of this data that I'm going to be talking about is things that we recognize. Next slide. And when we're talking about lesion localization, and that's what Joe was talking about, was this difficulty in ascertaining where the lesion is actually located. Um, there's a difference between the pre-planning CT scan and that of the actual reality of the patient on the table. And this is a good image where you can see um, where you can drive out or you can go down the pathway of the electronic target um, and you can actually kiss the electronic lesion, but it's actually nowhere near where the actual target is. And that problem is CT to body divergence. Here you can see in this image where the yellow is where the pre-planning CT scan is and where you can see the, the pink dots where you see where the catheter was, the GPS catheter was tracing out with a super dimension system. And that discrepancy is what we're talking about. Next slide. So why does CT to body divergence occur? Well, it's fairly simple to understand if you think about how we capture the images with a, the pre-planning CT scan. When you're undergoing a pre-planning CT scan, that pre-procedural CT scan, you're laying in this, a patient's laying in the CT scanner with their arms up above their head, 
with a full inspiration. And typically they'll hear a robotic voice go off and say, please hold your breath. And then the helical CT will then quickly spin and capture the image somewhere in the inspiratory reserve volume. No humans are perfect where they capture the image at total lung capacity. But somewhere in the, uh, the IRV of the inspiratory reserve volume is where we're capturing that image. But then when we go to bronchoscopy, we're actually performing the procedure in tidal volume. But if you have atelectasis, which actually occurs in most conventional uh, ventilation strategies, and even with high tidal, high tidal volume, high peep strategies as well, you're actually gonna be navigating in the expiratory reserve volume. So way down here at the, at the bottom of this graph, where, and it has nothing, and it, it's completely different anatomy. Next slide. And so here's a good image where you can see um, the preoperative inspiratory scan and then the navigation bronchoscopy image, um, how the patient's lying in the supine position with their arms down. And then when you look at this divergence graph or where you can see these images and see this overlay, now central airways, they tend to be where they are. But as you get uh, out into the periphery, you start to see the divergence uh, becoming more uh, prominent. And as you notice a, a significant amount of divergence as you go down into the lower lobes, which also correlates with poor diagnostic yields in the lower lobe. Next slide. And so if you look at this, let's go ahead and build this slide out. Um, you can see the pre-planning scan and a comb beam CT scan. This is this is the, the nodule, and you can see that this not a nodule that's uh, tens millimeters, 11 millimeters, 12 millimeters. Um, the difference in the divergence could be the, even greater than the actual size of the lung nodule. So this divergence is causing us to have these lower yields. And even with uh, all of the advanced technologies and guided technology, including current uh, platforms for uh, diagnostics, we're roughly in that 70% zone for diagnostics. Next slide. And so why does CT div body divergence occur? Well, the answer um, is fairly obvious, but I think one of the things that we don't realize is that there's significant amount of atelectasis when we're performing these biopsies. And so if you look at these images to your right, this is uh, patients with a pre-planning CT scan. And to the right of that, um, you can see uh, images with atelectasis. And this is the, uh, the tool and lesion scan with cone beam to the right. And you can see that the lung architecture is completely different. Um, and uh, there is approximately 40% of patients that undergo conventional uh, ventilation strategies will have um, significant atelectasis that either partially obscures or completely obscures the lung lesion. And there's also tissue distortion, right? So what do I mean by that? Let's say if you have a robotic catheter and you move the airway and then the, the local anatomy changes in proximity to the target. So there is no algorithm that can correct for CT body divergence with virtual technologies when you're actually moving airways around. You can also cause hemorrhage. And then there's a, a, a myriad of other potential factors, pleural effusions, perturbations in anatomy, right main stem intubations, um, changes that occur at the time of the procedure. All of these things contribute to CT to body divergence. Next slide. And so what do we do with bronchoscopists? So in the current standard of care, we all reach for our radio probe EVIS. Uh, our radio probe EVIS obviously is a 360 degree lateral looking um, transducer that's, uh, that uh, captures echogenic uh, images based on density. But Rebus is only lateral looking. It cannot look forward. And so these images that we look, like, look at lack directionality. And you know, it's great when you have concentric images and, you, and you're pretty confident that you're in lesion. But if you have an eccentric image, which does happen to all of us, um, there is no directionality and it's very difficult to obtain target alignment. And then what really bothers, um, uh, or really bothers me personally, but also this idea of having radial probe localization is that non-aerated lung and atelectatic lung or even hemorrhage can produce a concentric pattern with very sharply demarcated lung uh, borders or regular borders that mimic lung nodules. And so then we see these false positive images. We believe that we're in the lesion. We have increased provider confidence, and then we go and biopsy normal lung tissue. 
or lung tissue that is not related to the actual lesion. Next slide. So you can't really rely on radial probe to be a very accurate form of lesion localization. We already know that virtual, you know, the, the green ball, the yellow ball, the purple ball, all of these, these virtual images are not accurate because of CT to body divergence. Then you, we utilize this radio probe to go out and try and uh, visualize these lung nodules and then look at the lesions on the right. Those lesions are from the iLocate study and these lesions are actually atelectatic areas of the lung. And so, and when we look at studies that with very high rebus sensitivity, we're probably looking at lesions that have publication bias and really should be interpreted with caution. So radial probe lesion localization, at least in my opinion, is something that can improve provider confidence, but doesn't necessarily pan out in the yields. Next slide. So what do we need to do to correct for CT to body diversions? So we said the virtual bronchoscopy images uh, with the, the, you know, the electronic targets, uh, these balls that we talk about in terms of the different colors for different manufacturers are inaccurate. And then we look at uh, radial probe and we've talked a little bit about how you can get false positives and it's not accurate um, and it's not lateral looking. And then, so what do we, what can we do? So I think this is in, the, in today's era is that we need to come to terms from a bronchoscopy standpoint that we need to have imaging guidance. And so uh, there's only two commercially available uh, platforms for imaging uh, image correction uh, for lung, was lung vision and a lumicyte um, that does correct for CT to body divergence. Um, but of course, we saw, we heard from Joe about the issues associated with not having um, an ability to be able to have a distal articulating, stable, precise catheter that's robotically controlled, where you can uh, you can uh, take that to you can take advantage of that. Um, and then the currently uh, the robotic platforms don't have any CT to body divergence correction, and you'll have to rely on advanced imaging platforms like Combeam. Uh, and which is not readily available in most centers. Next slide. So this is where I think I need to get everybody to hone in on, is that we see a lot of studies, we hear a lot about diagnostic yield, we hear a lot about lesion localization. So lesion localization is not the electronic ball, it can't be because it's not really where the actual lesion is, it can't be the radial probe image, it has to be tooling lesion confirmation. Tooling lesion confirmation gives you the highest level of confidence that you're in it. Uh, if you're not in it, you can adjust, put your needle in it, uh, adjust your, uh, your needle, or if you're actually in the lesion, you can utilize any number of tools, whatever it may be, whether it's FNA brush, transbronx, cryopro biopsies, or even BALs. Um, and then we, are, we know that we have that confidence. Tool in lesion is what it should be the gold standard for lesion localization. If you look at this image from the Galaxy platform, you can see the needle in the lesion. And I think that covers it. And if, you, if you're sitting in tumor conference and you get granulomatous disease, or if you get a benign finding and somebody says, hey, um, are you, but you, you could have missed it, you could have been on the outside of it, but if you're dead center and you know that with a tool and lesion confirmation, then your negative predictive value goes up. You know that you're going to be able to have a higher level of confidence in those results. Um, and so, and this is where the gaps need to be addressed. Next slide. And this is where I'm going to introduce Dr. Kyle Hogarth from the University of Chicago, and he is going to spend some time talking about how we are going to overcome these gaps. Great. Hey, thanks, Chris. So I'm going to turn my webcam off. For whatever reason, that seems to be creating a problem. These are my conflict of interest as of today. Um, I am a options holder in NOAA Medical. I'm in serve as a consultant to several other companies, as you can see there. Next slide. So so why did we need robotics? I think it's outlined, but lack of vision was one of our problems in the periphery. Getting deeper in the lung was one of our problems in the periphery. But probably equally important was stability. So this was the, this was the impetus for both robotic platforms. Next slide. The challenge is though in any virtual navigation is that green, yellow, or purple ball really the lesion? And obviously we've got anecdotal observations of error within the ion and the monarch 
and the superdimension and systems, et cetera. And to Medtronic's credit, I mean, their, their correction of uh, superdimension with the fluoro nav uh, was one of the key components trying to first correct in real time uh, where the lesion might have been located. But it, obviously, as Joe highlighted, it doesn't have any of the advantages that robotic platforms uh, have. Next slide. And credit to Joe for the dancing ball slide. So here's a screenshot uh, from a Monarch case. Um, that yellow ball, of course, is not the real location. Um, it's a the virtual representation. You can see the virtual target. We're a little bit off. But actually, where that dot is, where the red line is, that actually ended up being uh, on a separate image where the lesion was located, uh, as confirmed by Rebus and then actually confirmed by biopsy. And those red lines between the two are the true CT to body divergence. And this is something that we see with all uh, platforms that navigate into the periphery by no matter what means, because next slide, because you'll frequently hear people say, well, that's an EM thing or that's a shape sensing thing. No, it's a current robot thing. So this is a nice slide uh, from Dr. Eisenhower's recent chess presentation uh, where she talked, uh, back at that point, thank you, where she talked about uh, their experience uh, and I'll show the data in a second. But what you can see there at the bottom of the slide is where the tip of the ion is versus where the lesion is on cone beam, and yet the ion says it's right dead center, um, and obviously it's not. Um, so it's not an issue that shape sensing fixed. It wasn't an issue that the uh, optical recognition plus EM that, that Monarch has fixed. It's an inherent issue related to dealing with the periphery of the lung and lack of external validation. Next slide. And that data from uh, Pritchett et al. Um, presented recently at CHESS, so this is an abstract, did obviously more importantly point out the degree of nodule movement displayed a random pattern. And I think when you saw from Krish's talk all the things that can affect uh, CT to body divergence, it should come as no surprise. There wasn't a way to predict for this. Put another way, we're not going to software engineer our way out of this with uh, uh, answers of, of trying to develop an algorithm to fix it. Almost 50% of the nodules were displaced by 10 to 35 millimeters. That's an important uh, phenomenon when you again think of some of the smaller lesions. This goes back to the, if I'm going after a three and a half centimeter nodule with whatever platform, I've got enough error room to give that I might have thought I biopsied the thing in the middle, I biopsied it on the left side. Nobody cares because I made a diagnosis. Next slide. So to really highlight that this is the problem, we've got solutions. Right now, uh, see, you know, cone beam, and then I'll talk a little bit about the body vision or the lung vision system from body vision. Krish alluded to these. Next slide. And it was on my initial slide, but I do have a conflict of interest with body vision as well. Just I want to make sure that I didn't I didn't mention that directly at the beginning. So we've all seen some of the images from cone beam. We've seen Krish's work, we've seen Mike Pritchett's work. Um, no matter what catheter or platform they're using, no matter what robot or navigation or just an empty tool, um, you get some fantastic images, right? And it blows us all away. The problem is, of course, very expensive. Um, I can occasionally get access to a cone beam system, but I have to give away uh, a kidney. So I've only used it once. <laughs> anyway, next slide. So then this is where advanced tomosynthesis comes in. So this is some nice images, uh, compliments of the folks from Lung Vision, showing what um, that Philips cone beam image looks like. So that's what your $1.2 million gets you. And then this is what your Lung Vision system gets you. Um, and this is using just their GE9900, but I've got a different system and it works with all the C-arms. But you'll notice there's tool and lesion. That is identical, except that's using a C-arm, the one you already own. Next slide. Here's another one on a small little lesion that you can see there on cone beam. And there's another one on, on lung vision. Next slide. Next slide. So how about integrating these? So it is nice to add some real-time tomosynthesis. So I'm going to share my experience. But you don't have, obviously, direct integration. It is one of the um, problems then of using an external system to try to correct your other system. Um, I'm going to share this one. But obviously, as we know, other robotic platforms are trying to pair up with mobile cone beam systems. Etc. but none of it's a direct integration. And more importantly, it's also an, an, an extra cost. Next slide. So I'm gonna share one case just to highlight this, this 64 year old guy, colon cancer, complex renal cyst, it's workup is pending and then found out a nodule. And apparently I was first, so I was asked to go after the eight millimeter lesion in the right upper lobe. It was PET positive, so was part of the colon. 
Um, maybe even the renal, but it wasn't sure. So this guy's a disaster. And he's got this little, go on next slide, this little lesion, um, and it's bracketed by two blood vessels in the right upper lobe. There is no airway directly going into it. So we navigate like usual. Next slide. But, and this is not what this is about. So then we do our lung vision system. So we've taken our spin. So there's my needle in the middle of the lesion, or at least I think it's in the middle of the lesion. So that's the key component to this. I have, um, and this is, a, this is version two of the software. Um, I'll show you version three that just came out. But there's a key finding here, and that is, um, I don't know if the movie's still playing, Adam. It was supposed to be a longer movie, um, but I guess not. Um, there. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, but what, what you're seeing here, go ahead and play it again if you don't mind. Yeah, so that's the comb, the, the C-arm-based image that lets me see the, uh, the lesion. Of course, my, my uh, fluoro vision is or my you know, baseline comb, um, uh, CT image is there. So I've got real-time confirmation. No, that's the video. I must have gotten truncated. No problem. Let's go to the next one. Because then this is the overlap you get. So go ahead and hit play. So you can see the monarchs out there. The yellow ball on the screen. Go ahead and play this video. Um, there it is. So what you can see here, of course, is now I know my needles in the middle of that yellow ball. This is when we've moved a little bit. And now again, can confirm I'm in that yellow ball. If I rotate my C-arm in any plane, I can prove that I'm 100% in it. Um, and so I've got confirmation of tool and lesion, now forceps and lesion. Um, and this turned out to be, oops, pushed a little too far there. That's one of the fellows. Uh, next slide. On first pass, it was metastatic renal cell. And I didn't bother to show you all the robotic views because you've seen those before. The key was we were up into an area trying to navigate for a little lesion. The green ball or the yellow ball was off by a little bit. Um, I think uh, ended up being off by about eight millimeters, but we were going after an eight millimeter lesion. And though, like everybody, I'm not too worried about bleeding. I do try to dodge the blood vessels if I can. And so having the um, augmented fluoro really provided some benefit. Next slide. So now I'd like to just present my first 45 cases using the Monarch with Lung Vision. So this is retrospective, it's not been peer reviewed. So feel free to rip it apart if this was Journal Club. And this is one user's data who's clearly full of bias. Next slide. The average lesion we went after was 16 millimeters. The average robot time from start to finish for a training institution was 56 minutes because my fellows do all the driving. Um, then when you added on the TOMO, it probably added another 20 minutes of total time in regards to both registration and then the biopsy time. So the robot time was, um, I apologize, procedure time was um, also EBIS, because obviously we, we staged the mediastinum afterwards. Um, and you see the lesions we're going after. Okay, now here's the data. So we're gonna slice and dice the data looking at various definitions, but I'm gonna come back to tool and lesion and, and go ahead and hit the next slide. I'm gonna have Krish pop in here too, because I think this is important. So on these 45 biopsies, look right up front, we had 32 malignants, and nine with benign histology. Four were non-diagnostic. So if you just take that um, and you want to be very tight and say only things that were cancer and only things that show granulomas or a pneumonia and an amyloid, so those are the four there, then that's a 78% yield. And so not all that exciting. But this comes back to how often do you sit there in tumor board? And you know, because I'm using this tool this TOMO that says, I'm in the damn lesion. Don't tell me that uh, my benign tissue is garbage. My benign tissue is the lesion. So if you get a little more liberal and intermediately and say these images that then were said were benign and on follow-up support the benign, you branch that out to 87. Now I got two that, two that are still pending um, and that takes it up to 91. And then remember I had one that was definitively non-diagnostic and had normal tissue or atypical cells but went to surgery and ended up being benign. So if we want to be real liberal, we can say 93. Now, what is not on this data is the 10 cases I've done since then, um, uh, which were all, um, and so you can rerun the numbers if you want, um, for malignant. Um, and of course, um, you can, I'm doing all this on the fly, but Chris, I, I really want you to comment, if you don't mind, on the nine benigns. I'm not worried so much about the non-diagnostics. Those, those are always an issue we deal with, and those are always need follow-up. To me, when I biopsy benign, and I know it's benign, but I fight to tell people it's benign, um, what are your thoughts, especially when we talk about tool and lesion? And then I'm going to show a video. 
Well, you know, I live in the histo belt and so we, and I also live in the tobacco belt. So I have high incidence of lung nodules. And obviously when it's malignant, everybody feels good and we can move on and we've accomplished the diagnosis. But then you're talking about what if you get a benign diagnosis? What if you get granulomas? What if you get um, inflammatory tissue uh, or scar tissue? Um, is it diagnostic? Is it not diagnostic? And this is where the power of tool and lesion really separates the discussion. I think if you're living in a virtual world and you don't know where you are, or you're living in a world just, just totally reliant on Rebus alone, um, you're going to be playing this guessing game. But if you've got visual confirmation that you're in the center of this lesion, then I think you or your tool and lesion, you're confident. And when you start to extrapolate, I've been working with Combeam for about five, five years now, and you start looking back at the data, what you realize with tool and lesion data is that the negative predictive value is extraordinarily high. Um, and you can be confident in your benign diagnoses going forward. And this is, I think this is what we need to, you know, kind of openly say is like, I think we're, you know, me personally, I'm kind of done with uh, lesion localization based off of virtual um, planning and rebus as being uh, as raising the level of, of of conversation. I think we are now in a situation with digital tomosynthesis and uh, and cone beam that tool and lesion should be really the main focus of every diagnostic paper because that's its job. Once you get to the lung lesion, it's, then it's up to you in terms of your diagnostic tools, and that's a, you know, a separate conversation. But tool and lesion is what matters, and that's what we should be all striving for. Agree. Next slide. Okay, so the version three just came out, um, and it's the AI uh, ability to recognize catheters and devices. Um, and so I'd like to show you one case. We've done two with it. Next slide. Okay, play this video. So there's the TOMO, and there's my tool, and the whole debate is if this is going to be a benign diagnosis, um, turned out it was malignant, but if this is a benign diagnosis, I want to be able to say with confidence. And of course, as I'm also thinking down the road towards any form of a therapeutic, I want to definitively know that I'm in the middle of this lesion. So I'd like to show you some imaging. So here's, we're just flipping back and forth. And that sure looks like the stuff that I see Chris and Mike show me with their cone beam systems. But I can assure you, I do not have cone beam. I can also assure you that sure looks like a tool inside the lesion. Now, maybe I'm a little off the side, so I'm going to take it again and, and push in a little deeper, and then I'm going to confirm that I'm in it. And this is what real-world TOMO can look like if only it was being integrated into my robotic platforms. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So what the world needs is a robot 2.0. Um, we've all now, for a couple of years, been playing with our robots, and I think this, the data has been supportive. We've all enjoyed it. We've, I think, seen what it can do for us. It's been a main workhorse for my program, uh, my partners as well. We definitely enjoy what it's been able to do for us. But we need a system that can incorporate multiple technologies, bringing in that reach stability, maintaining vision at all times, but finally adding real-time lesion updates to both the navigation and providing augmented fluoroscopy. So imagine taking your current robot, whatever you've got, but add the capabilities of FluoroNav equivalent uh, with target updating and lung vision with augmented fluoro and 3D views, and actually building that into your system. Next slide. So I guess it's my pleasure to introduce to you the Galaxy system, uh, something being worked on by NOAA, the sponsor of tonight's talk. So this is the next platform. So you have the benefits of our traditional robots, but with additional advancements and robot navigation platforms has overcome the gaps that we've been highlighting with a fairly familiar style controller. <laughs> I think there's a lag on my end, so I apologize. So the idea here, always on camera visualization with user interface software that makes that easy. A best-in-class reach, stability, and driving performance to get to these peripheral regions of the lung. 
And then obviously making it very easy to set it up and tear it down with a very small footprint to fit in multiple Bronx suites from multiple different angles and multiple different locations. So in other words, not being stuck with the two different ways to currently set up the robotic platforms we have, but giving you a lot more freedom. Next slide. But more importantly, addressing the gap with the Tilt technology. So this incorporates Tomo directly into the system. It utilizes the floor equipment that's already available and routinely used, and then intraoperatively, intraoperatively updates the lease and location so that the, in this case, purple ball is being put where it actually is, not where the CT thought it was. That was done two, three, four weeks ago or whatever. And as Chris also demonstrated, you can then get tool and lesion confirmation with three-dimensional fluoroscopic views to confirm across multiple angles that the tool you're wanting to insert into whatever nodule with your robot that drove you there is actually where everybody thought it was because you've confirmed that's where you thought it is because you can actually see it for real with a real lesion. Next slide. So it actually adds in this augmented fluoro. So obviously these are all early versions so far, but this blue ball representing the actual lesion. And then when you get it obviously updated, you can see you're not going to hit it. And so you're in, in, in this, the lesion allows you to orient and readjust and move across a couple planes so that you've got the ability after you've you know taken uh, the lesion and know exactly where it is. Plus, as Chris pointed out, when you do the TOMO, you'll still see the lesion separate from any of the atelectasis or hemorrhage or other things that you've added uh, to this case to also update the lesion's location. Um, and I think that's ultimately what's important as well, because you need to know the thing you are biopsying is exactly what you want. I think equally important, once in a while, we've all been guilty or had the problem of the lesion that was whatever size on CT, that CT is three weeks old, they're now in your bronch suite, and you swear you're biopsying a ghost. Um, you know, the lesion has shrunk or it's even resolved and so forth. And obviously, that's been looked at day of CT, 14% of lesions seem to go away. Well, Tomo obviously adds to that as well. You can obviously see in real time that you are biopsying a ghost um, in time to abort. Next slide. One other thing that's really fascinating is, is we all deal with the scopes and the reprocessing of our scopes and the shipping of these scopes after they've been used. The Galaxy is a single-use disposable bronchoscope. Um, it's designed for its performance and efficiency, the always-on camera so you don't remove the optics. Provides direct visual confirmation while you work, and while you're done working, you then throw it away. So you don't have any issues of cross-contamination. That is your disposable, the actual robotic scope. Next slide. I'm going to summarize and then I'm going to put, read one fine print out at the bottom that I forgot to mention at the beginning. Um, this is being uh, designed obviously with the intent to improve our outcomes in our surgeries. Obviously, everything that's presented here represents design goals of, their, of this company and the product has not been cleared by the FDA and is not for commercial sale in the United States. I so suppose that was obvious and people know how to read who are on this, but I will verbalize it so that there's no mistake. You cannot buy one. Um, the Galaxy system with the Tilt technology is the next-gen robot navigation platform. And it's the only robotic platform that integrates tomosynthesis into it and augmented fluoro directly into it. Real-time updates of the lesion location while you're bronching to help overcome CT to body divergence, to allow for confirmation of tool in lesion, and hopefully to overall improve diagnostic yield. But I think equally important, as Chris has highlighted, to give you the confidence when you because we're all pessimists and everyone must have cancer, when you actually prove the guy doesn't have cancer, you can believe it because for once you'll actually know you're smack dab in the middle of the lesion. And you can do all this without having to purchase a cone beam system and doing it all with a single use bronchoscope that allows efficiency workflow and then obviously potentially reduce this risk of cross contamination, but also reduce the risk of what's involved with the cleaning and processing of scopes. Next slide. If you're interested in learning more, there you go. You can reach out to Adam, he's the slide controller, or visit their website. Next slide. Awesome, Q&A time. Let me my partners join back in, and I'm imagining questions have been coming in on the online chat uh, that I think Joe is moderating. <clears throat> Joe, you there? There you are. I'm still here, but I seem to screw with the bandwidth when I show the video. It's my ugly face, so I'll turn it off. 
So I think I've been unmuted. So um, we have a couple questions that came in. And what I'll do is I will uh, ask them and then um, I will either try to answer them or uh, I will give it off to the panelists uh, to use. Uh, question number one, um, how do you feel this system will address the gaps that we are seeing in our practice? I think I think we've um, we've we've addressed that dur during our talks. I think um, uh, this system, uh, as Kyle pointed out, um, uh, truly merges a, a lot of a lot of the issues that we are having uh, with first generation uh, navigation. Right? Uh, you, uh, you you could localize better, and we have a structural integrity of the tip, as I talked about earlier. So I think it it combines both of those um, uh, shortfalls. Um, uh, or it, it combines it combines the solution to both of those shortfalls into uh, into one system. Uh, question two: Where do you see the system providing the greatest impact in the lung navigation market? And I, I think it's as Kyle pointed out. Um, I think it's it's really for hospitals that don't want to shell out the money both for robot and um, additional tech, whether that be um, uh, fluoronav uh, systems like um, uh, or add-on uh, 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 fluoronav systems like lung vision or any of the cone beam uh, uh, CTs uh, that are out there. So I think this is a real all-in-one uh, solution. If uh, Kyle, Chris, you want to add on to that, uh, feel free. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. I think I think you highlighted it, Joe. Um, you know the the robots. Uh, the first generation has been a nice. Uh, advance in bronchoscopy there's the market has demanded external validation you've heard krish with tool and lesion and we've not and, and the answer so far has been we'll go buy additional hardware and software and spend even more money to correct for the lack of tomosynthesis and i think what this represents is the natural movement forward of taking the robot and making it a better tool for what we need it for yeah. yeah, it's really a value added proposition if you think about it. Um, we, um, you know, I'm a latecomer. Unlike you know you, Joe, and and definitely Kyle, um, you guys were early adopters for robotics, and I actually had it the reverse. I had imaging guidance with cone beam, and then added the robot. And I think what and we, I think what I've learned from that was, um, you know, we talk about. The current state of robots but imaging guidance is is significantly important and um, can really um, provide a lot of value in terms of improving your diagnostic yield your confidence to a lesion um, and then you become a better bronchoscopist and when we're looking at uh, robotic platforms um, you know one of the shortcomings right now is imaging guidance and uh, if you're spoiled and you have uh, an existing cone beam system or if you but that's not the majority of individuals and i think if you're looking at the robotic platforms, you've got to think about this proposition of a value-added uh, imaging guidance plus um, a robotically controlled catheter system um, as being a, something that's going to garner some interest. I think, um, and Chris, you could speak most to this. You do a lot of cone beam CT. I, you do a lot of cone beam CT, and um, and your workflow of the cone beam CT is now kind of ingrained into your into into your workflow, your staff's workflow. You get this set up and broken down pretty easily. But I think um, for people who don't do you know the majority of their cases in cone beam, it's it's not the easiest thing to kind of navigate or manage or um, it's a lot. So if you could it, it, rather than going to a cone beam suite. If you could take a C arm and get yeah. near cone beam like imaging, right? And and really all you need is targeting and imaging that can help you with targeting and localization. You don't you don't need you don't need a Cadillac um, to drive you uh, to the library if you could if you could take a, a Dodge Dart, it's still gonna take you to the same place. So this, my point is is that you don't you don't need the highest end imaging always. You just need targeting and localization imaging, which is something we really never had before, um, unless it's some floral visible lesion. And now you could you could really uh, hone in on that. And look, it's not just uh, it's not just used to um, uh, um, move your plastic catheter around or your robotic catheter around. You could you could you could use your imaging to line you up a uh, you know in front of it properly so you could you could send your needle out into the right, you know, along the right 
uh, path to get into that nodule. There's a lot of things that you could do with this kind of imaging that advances you over the first generation navigation that um, we're um, sort of enslaved to. Been enslaved. Well, so Joe, Joe, we are part of several clinical trials that require injection of some substance into the tumor. And because it's not required to be dead center where protocols may require cone beam and, and Krish and Mike and guys like that, we just need to be, you know, show that we are in the lesion before we inject whatever vector that's being studied. Um, we've incorporated lung vision into that because it's Tomo and it gives me the ability to say I'm there. Yeah. And I think that's the other that's the other thing being opened up with built-in Tomo to robotics is all forms of therapeutic, not just microwave ablation or RFA ablation. I think that day will come, but not yet. Yeah, I, I agree. And Chris said this before. He thought that tool and lesion was the most important thing, and I uh, uh, more important than yield. I, I think there's a lot of people out there who would argue that, but but I wouldn't because I think where we're going with the technology, whether it be ablation or or intratumoral injections, you, you need to know if there's there's needle in uh, in nodule. And, uh, and unless you had a CT scanner or a cone beam CT scanner, you were, you're not able to do that. If you could do that in your Bronx suite reliably with a with a with a C arm. Um, and look, I mean, we're we're there's three now companies that could do uh, well, two companies now that could do this, and um, and and the third down down the road. So I think I think you know I think people understood this and 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 developed solutions for it. There's actually a question here. It says real time imaging or, or articulated catheter, and I think. Um, it's not that's not an or question. I think it's an yeah, and it's question. Yeah. You need a, an articulated catheter and real time imaging. Um, Correct. Tomo imaging, not not fluoro imaging, tomo imaging. And I think th those two together, if if you think about what we struggled with 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 first with all of these technologies um, with first gen navigation and behind, right? It was always we 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 didn't know if we were there. And we couldn't articulate the plastic catheter the way we needed to. But I think you put those together, I think you have a nice solution. For for what it's been worth, I've obviously been able to use the Galaxy in a research setting in a pig model. Um, so a live, breathing, bleeding pig with fake nodules, but that are a substance that is, you know, will show up on fluoro. Um, and the ability to correct the lesion location, you know, based on the fact that the animal is, you know, being ventilated is exactly like what Chris has, was talking about. And then having the augmented fluoro so that I can confirm my tool is in the lesion at the time of my biopsy. Um, so having actually done it, albeit in a fake model, um, it's pretty damn impressive and i agree with my two panelists um this is not an either or you need visualization articulation and you need tomo period yeah yeah i agree um and l last question how about integrating emn non-robotic navigation with body vision any experience on that for people who do not currently have robots um well i think that um i don't think you could kind of combine uh, EMN with, with I guess you could, um, with body vision, but, but, but body vision basically, um, uh, uh, you navigate out there and then you do your fine tuning later. Could you navigate out there with EMN? Uh, I, look, I think if you want an EMN with, with, with a body vision like thing, just use the Illumicide, right? Because of, of the Illumicide is, is first gen navigation. And then, well, not so much the first gen navigation, it's, it's EM navigation. And then you, you get out to where the nodule is and then you do your adjustments after you do your localization. So uh, that that's uh, for the most part already exists. I wouldn't have an Illumicide with a body vision uh, uh, together. Well, no. In fact, you you couldn't do a lumicide and body vision because they both use separate bead boards. Yeah. And but if you were using an older generation super dimension where there was no bead board, just the EM generator, I suppose you could. So if you have some of the first generation legacy technology and bought and purchased lung vision, lung vision has its own catheter. Joe has actually done a lot of good work and presented and published on the fairly nice yields using a 
fluoroscopically driven only biopsy platform. Yeah, and and look, uh, uh, you know, I know we're here to talk about robots, but um, but look, the, the, there's other things that could give you tip articulation and um, good tip articulation and, and imaging, right? And you could use a you could use a lung vision with an ultra thin scope if you wanted to. Um, there's a, the the, op, the the options sort of are, are limitless, so to speak. I think the important thing is is that whatever anybody wants to do moving forward is they, is they they settle on one thing. They get good at that one thing. They get comfortable with that procedure, with that workflow. Their nurses get comfortable with everything, and um, and then uh, uh, really the only thing that that holds you back is the uh, is the biopsy tool, which um, you know hopefully will will we'll fix this, down. When this next slide comes up too, the one that's cycling through, go through one more. So besides obviously joining the SAB, um, there was the slide that's announcing uh, at the. Uh, meeting in May, assuming you are physically going at the St. Regis, um, the SAB will be holding a cocktail reception and then an educational presentation um, that's going to be sent around uh, how to develop and build a bronchoscopy program. Uh, so for those of you that are already in a well-established program, trust me, there's ways to make your program better. I know that every day. <laughs> and um, for those that are starting or recently finished training and want to go build one, um, it's going to be a nice blueprint of a how-to. And of course, who doesn't like cocktails in a nice city? So um, come drink it with ESAB. <laughs> she gets church made. All right, well, look, I want to thank everybody for, for, for being on here. We had um, 141 attendees tonight. I think we peaked a little bit higher to that. It's a really great turnout. Um, uh, all of you uh, have uh, should have at least one of our contact informations, Kyle's, myself, Sir Chris's. Feel free to reach out to us. People people email me every day about the stuff that we have in our suite and how uh, it might help them uh, at, at their suites locally. Feel free to reach out. Be happy to talk to you, email you, text you, whatever. Um, and like and like everybody, my suites are always open for visitors. So come on by if you feel like it. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Noah again. I want to really thank the SAB for putting this together. And want to thank everybody for being on. Um, have a good night, everybody. Thanks very much, guys. Great job. Thanks for moderating it, Joe. Nice job, everybody. Thanks, uh -huh. attendees.